and actually start out with the Bible. I know, it's like, oh, where's he going with this? But one of the things that we really want to do, and one of the things I've been feeling really convicted on, is, is that we haven't been giving you guys the tools to read your Bible. And what we're going to do over the next year is really put an emphasis on being able to read the Bible. One of the things 500 years ago that really shaped the Reformation was this, this idea that as a Christian, you can read the Bible under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You don't need the priest or the pastor to intervene and explain everything for you, but you can read God's Word and see what He has to say for you. And so we really want to be able to focus on that and give you the tools. And part of what we're going to do is we're going to change some of the ways that we do things for preaching and make it a little more accessible so you can easier follow along as opposed to go here and there and everywhere. But the other thing I want to say is feel free to bring your Bible. We were watching this video at the prayer meeting on Monday night and showed this picture of this woman, older woman, and she had this Bible and it you could tell it was so tattered and frayed and well-loved. It's like she had been in this thing every day for 80 years. And we're all kind of like, I want a Bible like that, you know? I want to be able to sit there and read that and look through that, know God's Word that well. So I want to encourage you, bring your Bible to church so you can see what we're talking about, so you can live it and make notes in it, and you see, hey, this is where we're at. The other thing I want to do is I want to encourage you, if you're not going to bring your Bible, or you can do always do both, is to make sure that you got your Bible on your phone. You want to go ahead and put that QR code up there? This is a QR code. If you open up your phone and you open up, and yes, I'm saying it's okay to have your phone open during the sermon, okay? If you have the camera on your phone and you just pointed at that thing, it'll give you a little thing that says click here, and it'll give you a link. And we checked it on this week, and it works all the way to the very back, and it works both Android and iPhone. But if you click on that, it'll download the Bible app for you. And it's really slick, because that way you've always got it with you. Let's be honest, most of us always have our phones in arm's reach. And this way you got it there. And it's funny, because I remember I was sitting in Bible study one time at my old congregation, and this is probably like 10 years ago now, before everybody had the Bible on their phone. And I look over, there's this one guy, and he's like a pillar of the congregation. He's a smart guy, thoughtful guy, loved the Bible. And I'm like, why is Brett looking at his phone in the middle of Bible study? And they're like, oh, he's looking at his Bible. And it's just great because you've always got it there. And it's easy to read and it's easy to search. And there it is. So I want to encourage you with that. Now, we do have Bibles in the center section, so unfortunately, you guys on the edge, uh, I don't know, I think you're second-class citizens. You're definitely going to have to bring your own. But what we want to do is encourage you to walk through the Bible with us, and we're really going to make this a priority. And over the next year, you're going to see more of this. More Bible reading leads to more prayer. More prayer leads to more Bible reading. It's this virtuous circle, and it's a wonderful thing. And we really, as a congregation, want to be in God's Word. We're not, here to, 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 we're not here to hear what me or Anna or anybody else has to say. We're here for what God has to say. And that's really what we want to go through. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to pick up with this passage we just heard Nevea read for us out of Romans chapter 6. And it is this beautiful passage. And let me just set the stage a little bit before we get to Romans 6. The second half of Romans 5, what Paul is writing about is he's explaining to the church in Rome, and he's saying, okay, here's what you need to understand about God's grace. And he says, look, no matter how big your sin, God's grace, God's love is bigger. And he uses this example, and he says, look, whatever you've done, whatever your trespass, whatever your sin God's grace, God's forgiveness is bigger than that. I mean, let me put it in these terms. Imagine for a minute you were down on County Line Road, and it's late at night. Let's say it's like 2 in the morning. And you're just sitting there at the stoplight, and it crosses your mind to say, you know, I wonder how fast of a start I can get with this car. And I wonder how fast I can go in this car. 
Oh, come on. You all have thought it at some point. And so the light turns green. And you put the pedal down to the floor. And you're going really fast. And it's like 2 in the morning, so there's nobody else around. And you're like seeing the red light up ahead of you. And you're like, you know, there's nobody here. Let's just barrel on through. And so you keep going. And you keep going. And you keep going faster and faster and faster. And just as you're about to hit that top speed of however fast your car is going, you see the sirens behind you. <laughs> and because you might have said something rude to the police officer, maybe even you were trolling him because you thought he might have been a Bears fan, you have a massive, absolutely mind-bogglingly expensive speeding ticket that you cannot afford to pay. Okay. But then you got a rich uncle who comes and says, yeah, you're an idiot, but I'll pay it for you. It's fine. And what Paul is saying is he's saying no matter how big, no matter how massive that speeding ticket, your uncle will bail you out. You might go through every red light between here and Racine, and he will still pay that fine and not even notice how bad it is. But now that's where Romans 6 picks up. You go and go put that first verse up there, Romans 6, chapter 6, verse 1. That's what Paul writes. What then shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace might increase? Saying, shall we keep doing this, keep doing worse, so that our uncle can bail us out more and show us how much more he loves us? And Paul goes on, verse 2, by no means... We are those who have died to sin. How can we live it in any longer? Or don't you know that those of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Let's take a look at verse 4 here. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. He's making this case that, look, yeah, God gave you this. God did these things for you, but you're called to live a new life. You're called to live in this new way. See, the first part of Romans is all about how Jesus died for your sins. Jesus died to set you free. And the second half of it is how do we live in response to that? It's a great verse. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. God's kindness leads to our repentance. Love it. God is so good to us, we respond out of what he's done. It's not be good or else. It's because God is so good to you that you live this new life. And it's a great way of thinking about it. It's a reminder. And what Paul is doing in the rest of chapter 6 here is he's using the language of slavery. And it's important to remember just the cultural difference here. Cultural, the slavery in the Roman Empire was not the same slavery that we think of in pre-Civil War America. What it was there is you could end up as a slave because you were in debt, because somebody in your family was in debt, because your city rebelled and they conquered the city again, because your tribe was conquered by the Romans. There's all sorts of reasons that you could end up as a slave. And then somebody could buy you out of slavery, you could earn your free, freedom, you could do all these things. So you might... One day, just end up in slavery. Ten years later, you might just be free again. And it was something people could float in and out of, not a race-based thing, the way we think of it. And so he's using this language of slavery. And he says, yeah, imagine this, okay? You're a slave. You're a slave to sin. You are tied up in this. And then, boom, you're free. How do you live? You don't live the same way anymore. Could you put up that verse 14, please? This is what he writes later in the same chapter. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you're not under the law, but under grace. And what Paul is saying, you don't live the old way anymore. I have been a part of a number of congregations where they have recovery communities, places where people who are formerly addicted to drugs, to alcohol, to gambling, what have you, and then they get free from that addiction, and there's communities to support them. And those folks are always so wonderful about living out this passage because they truly understand they used to be a slave to that addiction. 
And they used to say, you know what, this was awful for me, and it did horrible things to it, and I still had to serve it all the time. And now I'm free. And say, I don't want to go back. And most of us don't have a story that dramatic. And so a lot of times we're like, intellectually, we're like, yeah, that, that makes sense. But we don't get it at a heart level. And I want to take a minute, and I want to hit one of those sins that is in particular for people in church. And it's how we talk. I want to see how nervous everybody gets with this. There is a certain reputation that church people have of gossiping, of talking judgmentally. Maybe you've heard that. I don't know. Nobody's owning it today. You're all being very stone-faced on me. That's okay. But one of the things that's notorious for churches is kind of that gossip thing, that judgmental thing. Let me tell you two stories. Don't worry, neither of them is from here. One time, back at my old church, I was the guy who ran the prayer emails. And so when somebody needed a prayer request, we sent it out to like 80 people via email. And I remember one particular week. We had a whole bunch of part-time people for like children's choir and all this stuff. These people who work like five, ten hours a week managing this or that little thing. And one week on Monday, somebody gets into a car accident. So I send out the email saying, hey, can you pray for so-and-so? They were in a car accident. Next day, somebody else was having a job interview for their day job. And so I send out, please pray for this person. And I forget what happened on Wednesday. Somebody's kid ended up in the hospital for something. And on Thursday, I send out, hey, can you please pray for the staff? It's been kind of a crazy week around here. And I get all the chitter, 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 chitter of... What's going on with staff? What's going on? What's the real story? What's really happening? So, of course, it comes back to me because it always comes back to me. And I send out another email saying, some of you have been asking what the real story was. I already told you the real story. Somebody was in a car accident. Somebody had a job interview. And somebody else had a relative in the hospital. Just relax. But we do this because that insecurity, that wanting to be at the center of things. And sometimes we do these things to build ourselves up. I remember I worked with a guy once, and he was smart, and he was funny, and he was witty, and he had a really deep, incisive view of humans. So he would work with somebody, and then he knew exactly what made them tick. And then he would make fun of them. And when I started working with him, I thought this was hilarious, and I really enjoyed it, because it's like, oh, yeah, he's a bunch of idiots we're working with. And then after about six months, I realized, what does he say about me when I'm not in the room? And I'm like, oh, crap. And it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, this is just, I thought I was building myself up, and now I'm just more concerned. And so often when we do these things, so often when we say these things, what we're doing is we're trying to be our own God. And we're trying to make everybody else down, or we're trying to make ourselves at the center of things. And what does it do? It's going back to being a slave to sin. It's going back to this thing where we're, where we're just in that same thing. And what Paul is writing is you're not a slave to this anymore. You don't have to be in the middle of this. You don't have to stay the same. Does anybody remember what the Eighth Commandment is? I know, I can see all the wheels turning. It's like, it's murder, adultery, Sabbath, don't root for the bears. <laughs> what was that? Yes! We didn't, you're the first one all this morning who's got it. Don't bear false witness. And, and you think, you hear that term and you're thinking, okay, well, if I'm in court, I'm okay. But that's only part of it. When Luther talks about that, he has this great way of unpacking it. And he says, look, it's not just about not lying, but it's about speaking well of the people around you. It's about putting the best possible spin on things. It's saying, well, you know, they said this, but I'm sure what they really meant was this much kinder way of putting it. 
Because it's so easy to get in that tear-down mode, that harsh mode. And we want to speak well of people. I remember way back when I was attending this church. This was back, well, back before I had kids. I think it was even before I met Lorianne. And I remember the children's ministry person at this congregation. She had this wonderful way of talking about the kids. And there was a lot of rambunctious junior high kids. And she'd always be like, they're all good kids. And at the time in my life, I was like, are you sure? Are you really sure? Because I had no experience with junior high kids other than like, I don't want to see them. I don't want to hear them. I just want to show them over there. But she had this wonderful way of talking about them, saying they're made in the image of God. They're all wonderful. And yeah, they got work to do. And yeah, they got behaviors to work out. And yeah, they got through things. But it's this beautiful thing of saying, oh, yeah. God loves them, and it's great. And it was infectious. It just spread throughout the church that you would just see that, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, they're, they're throwing burning rolls of toilet paper, and we got to work on that, but they're still good kids. We just need to work on some of the behavior. And that's how we're called to talk. And people should know us by how we talk. Not in the words we use in some of those Christian phrases that we're always so trite on, but in our attitude. People should be able to pick it up immediately. Let me tell you this other story. When I was, uh, way back when, we got to go to London, Lorianne and I, again, this is before we had kids. And one of my little quirks is that when I'm somewhere, strange city, what have you, I like to just pick up the local newspaper and read it. It's kind of fun. You get to see what the locals are arguing about. You get to see the local sports teams. It's, it's, just, it's just fun. So she was in some little shop, and I was just sitting outside, reading the newspaper, enjoying myself. Nice, beautiful London fall day. And I'm not dressed like aggressively American or anything. It's not like I've got the big American flag t-shirt or on or anything. I'm just, you know, nondescript. As most of you are thinking, that's normally how you are. Um, and so I'm sitting there reading the paper, and somebody comes up to me, sees me, dressed normally, reading a local newspaper, and says, hey, can you help me find my way to, and I forget, train station, what have you, whatever it was. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I am not from around here. And I could see by the time I got the second syllable out of my mouth, she just, the, her expression and demeanor just all changed. And she's like, oh, you're a yank. And it was just, <laughs> and it was just funny. And I tell you that because that's how we're supposed to be as Christians. When we're in those situations where everybody wants to tear others down, when everybody wants to speak ill of others, we should be the ones speaking love. We should be the ones speaking peace so that people know who we are, so that we can spread that love of Jesus in this world. And so, friends, I tell you that. Because it's not about how good you are, but it's about our new life in Christ. This is the whole point. That we live not in sin, not trying to test the limits of God's grace, but in response to that. Living in what he's given, living in the Spirit, and taking joy in everything that he's given us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for these words from Paul. Thank you so much for this grace that you've given us. Thank you so much for this chance to live out of kindness, out of the repentance that you've given us. We pray that we would be able to speak life and love and share the love that you've first given us with everyone we meet. Amen.